There are only two kingdoms, the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. Those who do not belong to Christ are under the power of the kingdom of darkness. Those who belong to Christ have been rescued from the dominion of darkness and brought under the power of a new jurisdiction, the kingdom of heaven. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. But by our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. That's Ephesians 2, 1 through 5. If you're thankful for God's delivering power, comment, I've been set free. Clearly, you and I no longer belong to the enemy or his kingdom. The enemy can no longer touch us. We know that God's children do not make a practice of sinning, for God's Son holds them securely, and the evil one cannot touch them. That's 1 John 5, 18. The enemy can no longer own you, inhabit you, or have dominion over you. Still, the enemy can attack you. The way the enemy attacks the believer is quite different from the way he attacks the unbeliever. Spiritual warfare is different for the Christian from the way it is for the non-Christian. In fact, the unbeliever isn't even engaged in spiritual warfare. They aren't resisting the enemy or fighting against his will at all. They're just bound, totally under the power of the enemy. The unbeliever is subject to the power of curses, demonic possession, and the worst forms of demonic assault. In severe cases of demonic influence, it's even possible for demons to directly physically harm the unbeliever. The enemy attacks the unbeliever from a place of authority. By contrast, the enemy attacks the believer from the desperate position of defeat, though deception might make it seem otherwise. Because you and I now belong to God, the enemy is quite limited on how he can attack us. Now, this doesn't mean that we should be apathetic toward or ignorant of the devil's strategies. We must be engaged in combating demonic influence. But in dealing with demons, there's a balance to be had. Some believers are so obsessed with demons and demonic power that they minimize the Holy Spirit's power. And other believers are so skeptical of demonic power that they leave themselves wide open to attack. To help you find proper balance in dealing with demons, I want to show you, using Scripture, the limitations of demonic beings. Number one, demons are not omnipresent. When an evil spirit leaves a person, it goes into the desert seeking rest, but finding none. That's Matthew 12, 43. Demons can only be in one place at one time. The verse in Matthew 12 illustrates the fact that demons travel, they move about. The fact that they can move about is proof that they are not omnipresent. By definition, if someone is omnipresent, they are unable to move from one place to another since they are already everywhere at all times. Number two, demons cannot read your mind. Scripture clearly communicates that God alone can see into the human heart. Only God knows your thoughts. Then hear from heaven where you live and forgive. Give your people what their actions deserve, for you alone know each human heart. That's 1 Kings 8, 39. Now, it may seem sometimes like the enemy can read your thoughts, but biblically speaking, this can never be the case. If someone thinks that a demonic being is reading their mind, they have to consider at least two possibilities. The first possibility is that they may be mistaking their own negative thoughts for demonic voices. When a demon seems to reply to what you're thinking, it's possible that this reply could actually be your own voice of negativity of the flesh. The second possibility is that demonic beings are simply reading exterior clues. It should be noted that demonic beings have been studying mankind for thousands of years. They are highly trained spiritual assassins. They know human nature. By simply looking at body language, listening to voice inflections, or observing your actions, they can get a pretty clear idea of what's going on within you. For example, if I have something on my mind, my wife can tell what's running through my mind just by looking at me. She doesn't need to be able to read my mind in order to be able to read me. 
Likewise, those closest to me have learned to read me. In the same way, demons learn to read you very well, creating the illusion that they can see your thoughts. Consider also the fact that demonic beings communicate with one another. Just see Matthew 12, 45. What one demon sees you do and say in secret can be communicated to another demonic being. They share your secrets with one another. They could use this intel to create the illusion that a demon or a demonically influenced person is reading your mind when they're actually just receiving intel from the demonic beings who observe you regularly. Through careful observation, demons can see clues that tell them which lies affect you the most. They know when you're anxious, depressed, paranoid, angry, tempted, and so forth. For example, a demonic being might say something like, God has rejected you. Then it waits to see if your heart rate rises, if you pace the room, or even if you jump online and run a search for Bible verses about God's rejection. From exterior clues alone, demons can learn to predict what you might be thinking in any given scenario. This is one way they exaggerate their power, but this isn't the same thing as them being able to read your mind. Number three, demons cannot see the future. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. That's Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. In the book of Isaiah, we see a definitive statement. There is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. It's rather straightforward here. One of the distinguishing abilities that God has is his ability, his exclusive power, to see past, present, and future as one picture. Much in the same way that demons can read people without reading minds, so they can make educated guesses about the future. This would explain why some who operate under demonic power are seemingly able to predict certain things. Just as an economist can make an educated guess about the economy, so demons can make educated guesses about the future of any one individual or even society as a whole. They look for key indicators and trends. Additionally, it's also possible that demonic beings work to fulfill their own predictions. But we can conclude that demonic beings cannot be omnipresent, cannot read minds, and definitely cannot see the future. Those are their general limitations. In short, against the believer, demons can use their voices to lie and torment, but hardly more than that. If you found this teaching helpful, remember to leave a like and let's stay connected. Don't forget to subscribe and click the bell so you don't miss any new videos. And remember, these videos are made possible and kept free because of generous and selfless people like you. If you've been blessed by this ministry, consider paying it forward by becoming a monthly ministry partner today. Just go to davidhernandezministries.com slash partner to sign up as a monthly supporter. Thank you and remember, nothing is impossible with God.